Welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mariashin. Thank you for joining us today. If you like what you hear today, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook. And be sure to visit our website, b'naibrith.org, to learn more about our important work. Imprisoned by the Soviets, family killed in the Holocaust, elected prime minister, crowned peacemaker by the Nobel Prize Committee, haunted by the Lebanon War. Menachem Begin was a pillar of the state of Israel and a tireless fighter for the Jewish people. He was, at the same time, a controversial leader. With evocative imagery, rarely seen archival materials, and revealing interviews with those who knew him, Upheaval, a new documentary on Menachem Begin, portrays the life and essence of this brilliant, tough, complex, loving, and proud man who never compromised with the survival of Israel and the Jewish people. Let's take a look. His whole vision for Israel was for Jews to come here, feel like it's a safe haven. What he want to say is stay straight. Very different from my political views, but I think he was one of the greatest leaders that Israel had. Menachem Begin believed in the need for the Jews to seize their future. Begin was very much a survivor. Never again there won't be another Holocaust in the history of the Jewish people. He was described as being anti-democratic, but he proved to be the most democratic of all. He had faith in his convictions and a very clear view of the way that things are supposed to go. He was a hero for all the Jewish Ethiopian community. No more war. He had the credibility to make the first peace with an Arab nation. He was a man of profound contradictions. Both sides were engaged in an existential fight. Israel has nothing to apologize for. Menachem Begin, with all his faults, belonged to a different class of leader. You rise, you struggle, and guarantee the prospect of living in peace for your children and their children. Upheaval is a nuanced look at Menachem Begin and the history of modern day Israel. Film critic Michael Medved calls the film an essential and masterful primer for anyone who seeks a better understanding of the Middle East. But joining us today are award-winning documentary maker, Jonathan Gruber, director, writer, and producer of Upheaval, and Rachel Greenberg, producer and researcher of the film. I'll be chatting with them about the process of making the film, the film's message, Bacon's legacy, and more. Rachel, Jonathan, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for that great introduction. Well, Jonathan, we'll start with you. It's, it's the, the typical opening question, but it is essential uh, to understanding this film. Uh, why did you choose Menachem Begin? So I was uh, fortunate to be brought on to the project. Uh, now we're about two and a half years ago. Uh, our executive producer, Rob Schwartz, had just read the book, The Prime Ministers by Yehuda Avner, and was really uh, smitten, I would say, by Big and, and wanted to find out more and, and wanted to see a documentary on, on the man, but couldn't find anything. And uh, he was a former chief of staff uh, for Senator Joe Lieberman, uh, they were talking and talking about books they had read. And it uh, turns out the senator had also just read The Prime Minister and was also taken by Menachem Begin. And so um, uh, Rob said to, to the senator, you know, call me crazy, but, but I think I want to make a documentary about, about Menachem Begin. And, uh, and the senator said, sure, I'll, I'll support you. 
uh, Rachel came on uh, and she can share when she came on to the project. And then shortly afterwards, um, they hired me to, to direct the film. And I was grateful. Um, really, I, I didn't know that much about Menachem Begin, aside from the, the Egypt-Israel uh, peace accords. Um, I was fascinated with his history, uh, how integral he was to the history of the state of Israel. So many things that I that I learned, but but really about him as a leader, and as, as you know, people have said uh, in the film, he was a mensch, you know, and that if you 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 could love him or you could hate him because he was controversial, but you can never say he was a hypocrite. And I think those are really important values for uh, for people today to to understand about him. What was your approach to making the film? A uh, lot of material out there, uh, yet um, he is a figure who now uh, left office, I think in 1983. Uh, so a lot of years have passed. So what was your approach? Did you, starting from the beginning, uh, how did you, how did you research all of this? Um, well, I have to give tremendous credit to the, uh, the person above me. Uh, and that's where she is in, uh, <laughs> on the screen is okay, Rachel. Rachel. Yeah, sure. <laughs> who, uh, who found incredible, uh, incredible Clips that we went, she went all over the country to find it. We had researchers in Israel um, who found clips in Hebrew that were from um, from the main channel. But there were so many nuggets of, of the man that you really just get a sense of of who he is and that he could narrate the film. We had these three main interviews along with news clips, and we wanted him to be able to tell his story as much as possible, along with the people who um, who knew him. Um, also, historians. I don't typically make films with narration. So we have people uh, narrating the story as we go. Um, and what was what it was a traditional sort of, you know, biography in terms of chronology. But what happened was that in uh, November or Hanukkah 2019, there were all of these anti-Semitic attacks in the New York area. And it just really shook me. And it really changed the way that I um, opened the film, which was to talk about sort of this, this anti-Semitism today. And, and how Menachem Begin would have felt about it, how he felt about anti-Semitism during his life and how he would have felt about it today. I tried to make that connection. So that was uh, sort of at least the overview of how we put it together. But I'd love for Rachel to talk about some of her, uh, some of the great things that she found. Yeah, Rachel, what, what are the most compelling aspects of his life, his career and his personality to you as you were researching this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's an interesting question, Dan. You know, you talk about his humility and his personal interest in protecting the Jews and their dignity. And I, I actually, um, I found lots and lots of documents that were labeled, my favorite was when they were stamped in red, declassified or top secret. And you're seeing something come out of it. And I just want to share a couple of examples with you and his language that he used. So one was a letter that he wrote to Margaret Thatcher. And this is when the Vietnamese boat people came to Israel. And, and for those of you who aren't familiar and haven't yet had the opportunity to see the film, one of the first things that Begin did when he became prime minister was to welcome in 66 Vietnamese refugees who were fleeing um, the communist regime. And he wrote a letter to Mark Margaret Thatcher, basically saying, we have a problem here. The world needs to come together and save these refugees. Enough with your conferences. We know what happened at the Evian conference. Every country now needs to come together and loosen some of their immigration, uh, immigration rules. And he wrote to her as he conjures up the Holocaust, which he does many, many times. He writes, as a Jew, I cannot forget the useless conferences at Evian and Bermuda whose end results were the non-saving of even one Jewish child out of one and a half million Jewish children who were dragged to a in death. And that, that speaks a lot to like what drove him in life. And the memory of, the whole, the memory of those who perished in the Holocaust were really for, uh, foremost in, in some of his actions. Um, another example is with Anatoly Sharansky in trying to save the Soviet Jews. And he wrote a letter to Ronald Reagan. And this is very interesting. And for those of you who don't know, is that even handwritten notes written to any uh, politicians in government are typed up and stamped top secret and declassified. And at the end of a letter where he's asking to help with Anatoly Sharansky, he wrote, I believe true justice would be done if you were released. If you could find it in your heart to do this, the matter would be strictly between us, which is why I'm writing this letter by hand. And these are some of the things that kept him up at night. 
and drove him to constantly think of, you know, the state of Israel and the dignity and the <clears throat> and the security of the Jewish people around the world. And he, you know, we're going to talk a little later, I'm sure, because you're going to ask about the multiculturalism and embracing some of the communities in, in Africa and other parts of the world. Um, but I was really fortunate to get to know some of the people featured in the film. And one of them is Danny Lemore, who was the Mossad agent responsible for bringing the Ethiopians over in the first mission. And some of you are familiar with the Red Sea Diving Resort film. That's the mission. And when the mission was completed, Fagan wrote him a note, a hand note, and it said to Daniel Lemore, who had the privilege of bringing brothers back to the homeland in appreciation. And if you actually listen to his word choice, it was Danny's privilege of bringing them back and not the other way around. And I think those examples really speak to the kind of man and leader Menachem Begin is and was. Was the family involved in the film in any way? He's had three children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they are very private, just as um, even though Menachem Megan was a public figure after he left office, after he resigned, but people didn't see him for, for years. Um, they're also very private and they did not want to be a part of the film. We offered them, we you know, said we're happy to, to interview you, but, but they just, they felt that his legacy um, was as is, you know, and that they didn't want to take part of the good news is that they did see the film uh, in Jerusalem in June and that they they were very uh, appreciative of it. And they felt that it did uh, their father justice and their mother, who is, you know, their parents justice is his um, Menachem Begin's wife, Eliza, is a, was a huge part of his life through um, from when they met in Poland, through <clears throat> the time that he was in the Gulag and she left to Palestine. And through the, the years in the underground, um, he, he always would speak about her. She was a, an integral part of uh, his life. And, and when she died, it, he was really a changed man. And, and I had the opportunity to be there in Israel. And they were, as Jonathan said, you know, seeing the family pictures or the pictures with the mother, very emotional. Um, they said that they're going to be challenged sleeping that night. But then he had one of my favorite lines. He said, you know, the hero of the story gave you a lot of great material to work with. So mm -hmm. I thought that was great. Well, Upheaval features uh, never before footage of Begin. Um, Rachel, as, as uh, the key researcher on the film, um, could you share what the research process was like in trying to ferret out this footage? Uh, how does how does one actually do that? I mean, much of what Begin did was uh, in the shadows, behind the scenes. Uh, I, I would assume a lot was never recorded. Um, some was handed down, I suppose, in stories and and in um, recollections somewhere. But um, where where did you where did you begin to to ferret all of this out? Mm -hmm. no, excellent question. And, and I'll talk after I, I talk a little bit, Jonathan could kind of talk about because he wrote the script. So he, he had the hardest job of taking all the material that we found and writing the story. But there are several areas that we went to. So first of all, we had full access to the archives at the Big and Heritage Center. Um, and they had some of the tapes. They had obviously a lot of photos. There are a couple of interviews that we talked about um, that were with Barbara Walters in there. Um, and there's one other one that we use pretty significantly throughout where he actually tells the story of his childhood. But one of the most interesting things is that I actually went down to Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee, to the Vanderbilt News Archives. And that's where I did a lot of the research. So any of the clips you're going to see, the news clips with like Walter Cronkite or Bob Faw. So basically in the 60s, the nightly newscast did not tape their news. And someone at Vanderbilt was trying to do a study and comparing bias and newscasts and realized that they didn't do this. And he found this insurance guy who lived in Nashville to underwrite and endow this national news archives. And from that day on, they actually taped NBC, ABC, and CBS nightly news. And that's actually a source, believe it or not, the networks go to Vanderbilt for the early tapings. And you could go online, but all you could find are abstracts. So we knew, we looked around and Jonathan had used them before and he had great experience with them. So you could look up Lebanon war, you could look peace treaty and get an abstract. But in order to really dig in and listen to them and transcribe them, I went down to Nashville for a couple of weeks and pulled all of the material 
um, and then shared it with insurance scribed it and shared it with Jonathan. And as Jonathan could talk a little bit about how he puts together the script, but he would highlight the different ones he wanted and talk about which one and go ahead and purchase. Um, and then for the documents, I was at uh, National Archives Library of Congress. I was at the Reagan Center, the Carter Library, um, and the Foundation. And so for me, you know, I'm finally coming back to my education because I was an international relations and history major. And that's what I loved, writing papers and research. And to me to like find a, a piece of paper folded and it only looks like white on the back and you open it up and it's literally the map they use to dis at the peace treaty. And they mark the settlements in purple magic marker and they mark something else in green magic marker. And to think that, you know, this is a seminal moment in history and you had people just sitting around a table you know, touching the different areas on the map and deciding wh where the lines are going to be. To me, that is is very exciting. And those, you know, nuggets, you know, really add so much to the film. It may be for five seconds, but when you show the actual documents, the, the peace treaty documents, and you see something crossed out and on the side, it says Begin objects or Israelis object. And, and it just adds so much to what, to what our, um, our interviewees are talking about. We interviewed Ron uh, Ron Ben Yishai, who was who was there, who was an Israel laureate, a you know legendary journalist, and he's saying how the uh, the the Egyptians were were tough negotiators, but compared to Begin, they were pussycats. And then you see this little you know piece of this video, this this uh, document. It just adds so much to to it. And I think that you know Rachel's. Uh, why Rachel is so great is because she's so comprehensive. And for me, my job was to be ruthless and to say, you know, listen, we, we, we're not doing a 10 hour film on Menachem Begin. We're doing a 90 minute film. So what can we, what, what is the, the Ikar, what is the essence, you know, of what we can extract from it? And we should, you know, also say that there were researchers in Israel who did a tremendous job for us. We have a lot of English language material because of what Rachel was able to find, but much of you know, what we what we uncovered was uh, from Israeli television. And that really um, was critical for in telling our story as well. Well, Begin uh, combined a great deal of toughness and determination with a very gentle and loving side, as we can see in the film. Jonathan, can you talk a little bit about the this interesting dichotomy and what it was like to represent that on film? Sure. Um, and, you know, I mentioned briefly about his relationship with his wife. And I think that that's just such a so powerful that this 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 man who is in charge of a country he, and he's been running for um, to be prime minister for nearly 30 years when he finally is elected in 1977. The first thing that he says is, I want to thank my wife who was with me, you know, during all these years. And, and he quotes from from Jeremiah. And he talks about how what it was like to be in the wilderness, you know, that you were, you were with me in the wilderness. And so <clears throat> you have that. But then you also have a person who said, uh, you know, we're going to bomb the, the Iraqi nuclear reactor. We have absolutely no um, issues with doing it. We did it because they were going to they were going to make a nuclear bomb. So I think that just, you know, in terms of the pacing of the film, in terms of how we go from selection to selection, we tried to. Um, show that there were different uh, differences in his personality. I wish we would have showed a little bit more of his humor. Um, you know, that, th those were kind of sometimes hard. You got sort of his wry humor a little bit. There's one, uh, one line where he talks about Jimmy Carter and sort of the tension that they have about, you know, what land is going to be given up. And he says, uh, Menachem Begin says, oh, Jimmy Carter should know the Bible, you know, knows the Bible better than anyone. He knows that this is our land. Um, the other thing is just little sweet, like a photograph. Like we were talking about the Vietnamese uh, boat people. There's a shot of Menachem Begin sort of holding, you know, gently holding uh, the face of one of the, the young uh, refugees that came to the country. So I think just it, his life was a paradox in many ways, you know, and someone one asked me, what was the difference between the public Begin and the private Begin? And I would say there really wasn't, you know, what, the, what he felt, the, the powerful feelings he felt from growing up during, uh, with anti-Semitism, with the Holocaust, being on the run, fighting the Arabs, fighting the British, that all of that combined to make him that um, complex and compelling character that he is. Well, as a leader, uh, Begin often spoke and acted on behalf of the unity of the Jewish people, talked about it 
uh, quite a bit. Uh, and he was considered a man of the people. And that, that contributed, I think, greatly to his victory in 1977, his surprise victory in 77. Uh, Rachel, can you tell us uh, a little bit about how this set him apart, perhaps, from previous Israeli leaders? Thank you, Dan. Yeah, so previously, the Labor Party and Ben-Gurion's party were who was in power. And there was a real elitism there. And there were a lot of Jews who were coming from North Africa, Iraq. So you had the Mizrahi, the Sephardim. And Begin has a very famous speech, which you'll hear in the film. But the idea is you're Ashkenazi, you're Iraqi, we're Jews, we're brothers, we're one. And that's a really important part of the story. And that's also how he ended up getting election, be elected because he was able to garner the votes of, of that base. He really cared though, you know, we didn't cover it as much in the film, but there's a program called Project Renewal where he really worked on housing and after school projects and really trying to break down societal barriers for them and give opportunity across the population in Israel. And, and a perfect, Perfect example is that is where he chose to get buried. So he's actually buried on Mount of Olives, Harai's 18, instead of Herzl. And he's buried next to two fighters, Barzani and Feinstein, who were in prison during the, the fighting for the state. And these two, these two gentlemen, one was Fardik and one was Ashkenazi. And they chose, they were simple, and they chose to actually blow themselves up with a grenade in the prison rather than being hung by the British. But that moment of the two of them together reciting the Shema, the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi, giving themselves for the state of Israel and for the survival of the Jewish people spoke to everything that Menachem Begin embodied. And he's buried with his wife, Eliza, on the Mount of Olives with him. And that itself represents the value of unity in Kalal Israel. Let's talk about the title for the film. I imagine Jonathan is a filmmaker. Oftentimes, this is one of the most important decisions you can make. What do you call the film? Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us about why you chose uh, the title of your film uh, to be Upheaval. Um, well, it came, um, once we hit it, once we came up upon it, we knew, of course, that had to be it. Um, when Menachem Begin was elected, uh, in 1977, the Hebrew uh, broadcaster says, uh, Yesh you know, this is an upheaval. And, I mean, it's translated in different ways. Some say revolution, some say upheaval. Um, we took upheaval, <coughs> excuse me, um, because I felt that his whole life was an upheaval. Whether he was fighting anti-Semitism uh, in Poland and, and as a member of Beitar, the Jewish youth group, uh, whether he was... Um, running from the Nazis, whether he was uh, incarcerated by the Soviets in the Gulag, um, when he was fighting the Arabs, whether he was fighting the British, when he was fighting people in his own party in order to, um, you know, get the peace accords uh, done. And of course, unfortunately, fighting uh, in Lebanon. Upheaval was the nature of his life. And it seemed like a perfect uh, summation and, and a perfect title for, for the film. Well, we'll now see a clip from Upheaval, where young Israelis share their thoughts on Begin and his legacy. He, he was from the old school Israeli politicians with, with all the, you know, like with all the light values and stuff. In Israel and all around, he's a symbol of uh, reconciliation. My mom is kind of still adores him. And he likes it. She likes him like one of his kids, you can say. <laughs> his whole attitude and his whole vision for Israel was for Jews to come here, feel like it's a safe haven. Rachel, do you think um, Begin's legacy, when you look at it through a 2021 lens, is, is, is uh, something that uh, brings a message to this time and this moment? Well, there's, there's so much of Begin that lives in 2021. And so I think one of the main things that we've touched on already is the multiculturalism and embracing all communities. And what you saw also is it manifested itself in what we call also the startup nation. So you're bringing people from different populations who are impacting the economy, the medicine, technology, culture, the arts. And it also incorporated a lot of the Arab culture. And so that ties into also the legacy of Begin as the peacemaker. 
you know, he compromised where other people weren't able to at that point. And, and I look at, you know, we're looking at the Abrahamic Accords right now and seeing what's come of it a year in. And there's so many, so much economic cooperation and embassies are opening up. And every day there seems to be uh, a new country that they're trying to normalize relations or some new feed. And, and, and it's exciting. But I think a lot of that comes through having that multiculturalism, having cultures be able to interact together. Um, and also that he was willing to take that risk. And to both Sadat's credit and to Begin's credit, it was both a great personal and political risk. And I think we're seeing some of the fruits to bear from that and how society manifested itself. Um, a couple of other things that are, I do believe are kind of from Begin's legacy himself is the Holocaust and how the Holocaust was internalized in, into Israeli society. You know, Previously, there there were people that didn't want us to be the victims, considered the victims there. And, and it was really important for Begin throughout to conjure up the Holocaust, whether it was Osirak and the Begin Doctrine, which led to a legacy of security and how you're going to be preemptive and never allowing another power to get nuclear arms and be able to attack Israel. So everything kind of led into each other. And the one area that I think many people talk about is Begin as the first Jewish prime minister, you know, he brought tradition back. When the country was first formed, it was socialist and secular and pioneering. And, and that was the image it was, it was heading into. And Begin really cared about being a chain and the link of continuity of the Jewish people. He, he brought the past forward into the present. And I think it's really important. You know, there are little things like El Al had kosher food or, you know, the day after he was elected prime minister, he went to the Kotel and and Davin there or prayed there at the wall. But the society has become more traditional over time. Obviously there's political, there's um, a lot of politics involved in that, but he did bring tradition back to the country. And, and the one last thing I'd say there is that everyone claims Begin now, whether you're the right, the center or the left, you know, during the last election cycle, there was a great um, headline in the New York Times. And it said, in Israel campaign, all sides claim fabled voice from the grave, Menachem Begin. And so he was the liberal Democrat, but he was also the traditionalist. And there's so much contradiction to him and complexity to him. And I think that's why what makes this film so great is that it not only tells the biography of Menachem Begin, but it tells the story of modern day Israel. And there's I no just question. Add Go ahead. Go ahead. If I can add one thing to that, I think another reason why people on both sides, you know, or on all sides of the political spectrum are, are you know, gravitated to Begin and, his, and who he was and what he represented and what, what these people spoke about that we just saw the clip of is he never enriched himself through his position. Um, he was just a sort of a simple guy after he, he resigned that people had to Put a collection together for him to get a, an apartment, a small apartment in Jerusalem. And so when you when you talk about leaders today who you know have their golden you know or platinum parachutes all set up, the fact that he um, didn't enrich himself, the fact that he didn't use his position to 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 for personal gain, um, I think speaks to to who he was as a person as well. Now you talk about Jewish pride. I th what stands out to me. Uh, over all of these years uh, was the signing of the Camp David Accords on the White House lawn. And uh, he made his comments, Sadat had made his comments, uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, but after <clears throat> Begin finished with his comments in English, uh, he said, and now I want to turn to my people and speak, I'm paraphrasing, to speak to them in our language, in, in Hebrew. Uh, and he spoke to Israelis in Hebrew. He was really speaking to the Jewish people. And that, I, I thought, taking that moment uh, where, you know, cameras were on, the, the millions of people were watching all around the world. And he took that moment to say, I want to speak to my people in Hebrew, my people, I guess, not being only the Israelis, but being the Jewish people. Uh, now, let's uh, take another look uh, at a clip from the documentary, uh, this time on Bacon's fight against anti-Semitism. Begin's Israel is an Israel of proud Jews who are not going to take anti-Semitism anymore, but are going to unite and fight. And that's a powerful lesson from Begin's life. Begin once said, you call me a terrorist, but I call myself a freedom fighter. Everything I did was for the freedom of the Jewish people. Here I stand in humility 
and with pride as a son of the Jewish people and as one of the generation of the Holocaust and redemption. Jonathan, the fight against anti-Semitism is one of the many themes uh, that appear in upheaval. Given the current climate and the recent surges uh, that we've seen in anti-Semitic speech and violence around the world, uh, why was it important for you to make that connection? Uh, Begin the fight against anti-Semitism, which really drove him through much of, if not all of his life. Well, I think if you just make a film about Menachem Begin uh, and leave it in the past, then um, then what are the lessons for today? But when you can connect it to sort of his own experiences of anti-Semitism throughout his life and his own sort of everything that he negotiated, everything that he believed in was because he felt that anti-Semitism was something that wasn't going to go away. And, and unfortunately, that's what we see now, you know, maybe in the United States, I mean, I grew up uh, in the New York area and uh, really sort of, I would say a, a gilded age, you know, to be a Jewish person where I could do whatever I wanted. There's a state of Israel, but people like Menachem Begin, who grew up and lived through World War II, had a very different um, idea of what anti-Semitism is. And, and now um, I think that we've come to understand that that it can come from the left, it can come from the right, it can come from all sorts of people, anti-Semitism, and that it's not about, oh, if you're progressive, then, you know, then you're going to be um, not anti-Semitic, that it can come, that it's not, it's about really saying that anti-Semitism today is something we must stand up for, we must fight it, we must recognize it, and we must not make excuses for it. And that's what Menachem Begin um, represented, just straightforward, this is anti-Semitism. I am not, you know, prevaricating. I'm not equivocating. And I see it as anti-Semitism. I'm going to call it anti-Semitism and I'm not going to take it. To talk about um, his, his going into seclusion in the last years of his life and uh, after the, the, the passing of, of his wife, Eliza, uh, the Lebanon War, which, which preyed heavily uh, on him. Um, I always saw this as also speaking to his his humanity, his his uh, uh, his uh, personal view um, that uh, he uh, uh, perhaps um, should have been there when Eliza passed away. I mean, this this made him very very human. Um, how do you portray this in the film? Uh, these these last years of, of Bacon's life. Well, there are two things. There was. Um... It's really about his leadership. Number one, he was he was unapologetic about it because he felt that he started the Lebanon war started because there were rockets coming in from the PLO in southern Lebanon, and he w was unapologetic to say we need to protect our people. What other country would would allow rockets to come in? Um, but there was also the fact that hundreds and hundreds of, of Jewish soldiers died, and when the initial objectives were were met, which were uh, to push out these uh, the PLO for about 40 kilometers from uh, from northern Israel, then then the war kind of got out of hand and ultimately he took responsibility for it. He didn't blame people for it, even though people say it was Ariel Sharon as defense minister, who was the person who kind of kept him in the dark. But ultimately, he said, I'm the leader. I'm in charge, you know, and whether it was the Lebanon war or even going all the way back to uh, to Deir Yassin. Uh, you know, during the fight for the state of Israel, he was always taking responsibility for when he was in charge and being in charge. And when things don't go right and when something awful happened during the Lebanon war, like the Sabra and Shatila massacres happened and the combination of his wife dying, he felt that he couldn't go on. He couldn't lead. And it wasn't he wasn't clinging to power just to cling to power. He felt I'm not the right person anymore. And that speaks to, as you said, his humanity. But it speaks to his sense of what it really means to be a leader. You're a leader until you can't lead. And he recognized that he couldn't lead anymore. And so he resigned. And, and that's a tremendous lesson for, for many political leaders and, uh, you know, today who, who do cling to power. Well, I'm going to ask you each uh, for the one takeaway from the film that you would like uh, viewers to, uh, to leave with. But I'll tell you uh, just one personal takeaway from his, from his life. I came um, to 
to the Anti-Defamation League in 1977. I was Middle East Affairs Director. And I think it was the next year we honored Begin in Israel at the Knesset uh, in, the, in front of that beautiful Chagall tapestry. And uh, my wife and I were seated in the, in the back and uh, Begin uh, spoke. Sam Lewis was our ambassador. And um, that night uh, there was a program. Everybody got a program at their place. And uh, my wife, who's an Israeli, has a brother whose name is Benny. So she said, I'm going to take my program up to Begin and have him inscribe this to Benny because Begin has a son, a son Benny, as well. And it, within three minutes, she came running back to the table and she said, come up, he wants to meet you. So I, we went up to the head table and he said, I wanted to meet the young man who married this lovely woman. Uh, and I, I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't, really didn't know what to say. First of all, you're not supposed to charge the head table at these dinners. <laughs> and I, I just thought, and we've thought of that many, many times. Now, Rachel, you said uh, the man was a mensch, and there is, there is no question uh, that this, this really, I think, um, explained everything. There was this, this basic, basic dignity and decency uh, in the man uh, that just touched everything uh, that he did. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask you each, what's the best takeaway that you'd like folks to leave with after they see the film? Go ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> you know, they, there's so many things to say about him. I, I think it's the man who knew his place in that, um, you know, when he was a leader, he knew how to lead. And, and when it was time for his, just that example that you gave, you know, he just said, I, I want to be sort of, you know, who are, who are you? Uh, who, I, I, he knew how to be a good host. He knew how to be um, a person who could really know his sense of history and know his sense of, of place. And, uh, and I think that's a lesson for everyone, whether, you know, that, and uh, for instance, he was in the opposition for 29 years. Who does that? Who stays, you know, as the leader of the opposition when you keep constantly losing elections, but he did it because of his values. And I think that's a lesson, this sort of uh, commitment to his own values that I think is a tremendous lesson for everyone today. Rachel? And so I think I'm going to combine a few under one umbrella, but it's don't judge a book by its cover. So whether people have all these opinions of Begin, and as Danny Lee Moore said, he's the most democratic of them all. He was colorblind. You know, our world is so polarizing. Um, and I think people need to be more open um, and explore and be curious and be interested, whether it's about Begin himself, the man, or about Israel. And Israel is complicated. And I think this movie shows just that. So our hope is that people learn, that they learn that they want to learn more. We start to peel back the onion and they're curious. And they start engaging and have more confidence in being able to engage in dialogue and discourse on Israel. Well, the film is Upheaval, The Journey of Menachem Begin. Rachel, uh, can you share perhaps with uh, our viewers where they can watch this documentary? around the country or around the world. Thank you, Dan. Yes, we have a lot of exciting things going on right now. Um, right now, there's a couple of ways to see it. One, if you went to upheavalfilm.com and watch, there's a couple of virtual cinemas where an individual could purchase a ticket. But what we're doing right now over the next, over the, these nine months, we're having special screenings, which means that organizations and affiliations are hosting special opportunities as well as film festivals. Um, we are showing uh, many states across the country. We're going to England in two weeks. We, we have Australia, Jerusalem, um, South Africa in the spring. So lots coming there. Um, and then in February, we're going to be on public television. And then after that, we're going to move into streaming. But immediately, since all of you will want to see the film now, if you haven't had the opportunity, please visit www.upheavalfilm.com. Uh, will there be any kind of uh, educational initiatives tied in uh, to the film as well, Rachel? Mm -hmm. There will be. So when we undertook this project, we asked ourselves what success looked like. And it was really important for us to reach the widest and broadest demographic, but also be able to use the film as an educational tool for young people to educate them on Begin, his legacy in Israel. And so we've entered into several partnerships. 
One of them, we're partnered with um, Open Door Media, who's creating a 25 minute version of the film and a discussion based curriculum, which is going out to high school students and youth groups. We've partnered with Stand With Us, who's gonna be taking the film to 100 plus college campuses in the United States, Latin America and Europe. Um, We've partnered with Fuente Latina, who does outreach to the Latin speaking communities, both in Latin America and in Spain. Um, to educate on the Middle East and Israel. And we've partnered with Israel Allies, who's reaching out to the Christian communities. And in addition, the Academy of Jewish Thought in South Africa is creating an adult curriculum to go along with the film. Um, And we're really excited that the Begin Center will be showing a 60 minute version of the film in the Begin Center starting next year as well. So anyone visiting that, Israel is a great resource to go visit that museum as well. Well, Rachel, Jonathan, thank you so much for being with us today and for talking with us about your film, The Life and Legacy of Menachem Bacon. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. Well, many thanks to Rachel Greenberg and Jonathan Gruber for being on today and speaking to us about their film, Upheaval. To learn more about the film and where you can watch it, visit upheavalfilm.com. And thank you for tuning in to this conversation with B'nai B'rith. If you enjoyed this discussion, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel, liking us on Facebook, and following us on Twitter. And be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn more about our important work. For our guests and for B'nai B'rith, I'm Dan Mariashin. See you again soon, everyone. Take care.